My name is Fred Scheich. I'm here at the 22nd Croix with Linda Gale Becker with the Desmond Tutu Clinic in, in Cape, Cape Town. Town, South Africa. And we appreciate you taking the time to be with us to give us a little bit of the background of, of the epidemic and how it's shaping out at this point in, in Southern Africa. Um, it's, it's had a long history of, of change and uh, hopefully for the better. And I think I'd like you to give that sense of that for our audience who may or may not be familiar with. Everybody thinks, well, it's taken care of because this and that. But I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of road ahead to be, to be traveled. Totally, Fred. Uh, you know, I think you're alluding to sort of previous histories and from whence we have come where treatment was so expensive, treatment wasn't available, it really was a human emergency. People, it wasn't even a government uh, And we had a government stuff. denial, uh, okay. which, which really was problematic. I was saying to a friend yesterday, you know, it's one thing to fight the pathogen, but when you have to fight the pathogen and the politics, it's, and, it, yeah. it's too much, really. Um, when I think about our epidemic today, the, the word that pops into my mind, particularly from my viewpoint in, in South Africa and the southern region, is just scale. It's just it really is a burgeoning epidemic. Um, and some of that is for good reason. We're now keeping people alive and those people are in our societies and our communities and it's fantastic. You can't tell who they are, they're on the antiretrovirals and it's, it's wonderful, but we know that the number of people living with virus has really increased. Mm -hmm. What is more, I think, troublesome for me, and I wrote a paper last year called the antiretroviral rollout in South Africa, the nuts and bolts. It's the nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. Our treatment program is just groaning under the size of it. Uh, today, data was released that we're over 3 million people on treatment, but those people need to get their treatment every single day, mm -hmm. know that when they go to the pharmacy, the, pharm the pharmacy is going to have antivirals for them. They're not going to be stockouts. Mm -hmm. It needs to be there. We need to be able to monitor them and make sure, and make sure that, through. absolutely. And that is a huge public health intervention of mighty proportion. And, you know, I think the, the challenge of this era is how we do that so in such a way that we don't lose quality. South Africa became well known, I wrote many of the papers myself, of the early intervention of treatment. And we were doing fantastically. In fact, people in Africa mm -hmm. take pills better than many parts of the world. Right. The problem is, as the program grows, the, the sort of personal aspect of the treatment program, the accountability to keep drugs there, that kind of thing starts to falter. And that's where we need to pay our attention now to make sure that we don't lose quality in the quantity that we're having to deal with. And then the other passion I feel today is that we have to turn the taps off in some shape or form. And that means reducing incidence, which means we have to shore up our prevention at the same time. Now, unfortunately, it isn't enough, as we've learned in 30 years, just to say, please use condoms and abstain or be faithful. We have to do more, which means those already quite stressed health systems are going to have to think of other things that they need to do. And, you know, this conference has been fantastic for making a very compelling, uh, you know, case for pre-exposure prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. So what's the role of pre-exposure prophylaxis in the setting? How will we do it? What are the platforms? So I have to tell you, Fred, I have to get back to South Africa right away because there's a lot of work to be done. And we need the resources to do that because, again, as we roll things out, I think it's absolutely imperative that we do it carefully monitoring what we're doing, make sure we really do come up with the best models, the best practice, ensure we're not doing harm, uh, and really move the prevention bus and the treatment bus along at the same time. And then, you know, lurking in the background, just in case you thought that was already an awesome Herculean task, we've got the non-communicable diseases sitting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a fantastic plenary this morning about cardiovascular disease, that make, made me break out in a rash, you know, because really we, we, we have that kind of 
imminent threat sitting in, in the back, mm-hmm. that if we keep people alive, which we really, really have to do, that we also have an epidemic of other problems waiting for us. It's going to need a skill set and a health system that really knows how to deal with it. So that's really very much a South African southern region uh, uh, sort of um, a, mm-hmm. you know overview. But I, but really, it is what Africa is is having to deal with at the moment. What kind of incidence is there? I mean, because you, we in our country figure there's maybe twenty five percent of people aren't on treatment or, or don't even know they're positive. They they're living with HIV. What you know, you have to be tested, yeah, get it, linkage to care, yeah. etc. So that's another piece of very important Absolutely. piece of it. Absolutely. Uh, so how do you have a sense of what what is out there? And it must be a large population that isn't. I mean, I think the good news is that if you look at ever tested, and there's modelling data to show this. We had a huge campaign a couple of years ago that our health minister ran. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the way, politics are much better now, and mm-hmm. really people are working very hard they, they and trying to get it right. Because they must see the results of, yeah. of the change. So, so, so we definitely had a real upswing in. In, in testing, there are still groups that are overlooked. So mm-hmm. men, uh, and particularly young men, mm-hmm. and young adolescents generally are not being tested in the way that and they're they the should ones be. that are most likely. Absolutely, to be and they're the people risk. who have the biggest propensity to onward transmit. So there's the bang for the buck, and we're missing mm-hmm. the bang for the buck, if you like. Now they're also notoriously a difficult population to link to care. Um, and so again, there's a gap in our research. How do we do that efficiently, effectively? You know, and, and there are new tools coming down the pike. Is it the lovely data from 065 that you could maybe think about cash transfers, not shown to be beneficial in America, but not tried in, in, in South Africa or, or Southern Africa. So you know, that would be one strategy. Is it peer navigators? What, what, is, the, what is the way to do this? But those are kind of key groups that we have not uh, we, we, we have not made good headway in. I think, you know, my overwhelming sense here, testing campaigns on their own are a little bit like kissing in the wind. We know that behavior doesn't necessarily change as a result of that. But testing is the, you know, it's been said, it's rather cliche, it's the, the gateway to everything else. The way I like to think about it, and my passion is adolescent health, as you know, is that testing sits at the top of a double helix cascade. Mm -hmm. And the helices uh, are what you do with people who are not infected, that are disease free, whatever. So I think it applies to TB, STIs, HIV, and what you do for somebody who has a disease. Both of them need an intervention. Mm And in the case of adolescents, I like to think about it as adolescent-centered. So I don't like to think about it as disease-centered. It's these two helices come down, they're intertwined, and we intervene at community level depending on what the need is. So let's cash in on the fact that adolescents gather in communities in shared venues. They go to football clubs. They... They hang out, you know, at malls. How do we use those community opportunities mm. to intervene? So I, I definitely think it's an era for thinking outside of the box. And, and you know, um, sometimes it's maybe bringing them into a focus group and saying, you know, tell what us. Works yeah, you, right. you, what works for you? Apps. You, you can't work in adolescence without doing that. You can't work among sex workers without it's, doing it's, that. Well, you can't, say? you know, Nothing MSN. about us without us. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, whilst I... I'm describing this design. I am pleased to tell you that we have a youth center where we have young people coming, Mm -hmm. and they are very vocal about how they like it to look and what they think will work for themselves. Maybe some celebrity or notables that can can speak to the issues or rock stars. Absolutely. So role models. Make it cool. Yeah, totally. Trend trend is where it's at with the younger folks. They've got to see it. and, and touch it and feel it and then make sure that their, their idols are on board. And, and by the way, what worked, you know, five years ago isn't working today. Yeah. So it needs to be dynamic, it needs to be flexible, it needs to be fast moving. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you can't keep up with that, then do something right, else. Right, right. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, I think you've covered the, the, the background that's really important mm-hmm. here. This mm-hmm. is a project that, that, um, that is so important because you have such a high incidence um, and getting that community viral load down is key in this in your community, as it is in any large city. And you've got a population that needs to be uh, really seriously, more seriously addressed, or on uh, continuously 
seriously addressed. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, that we all pretty much face the same challenges. Uh, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's just sort of multiplied in terms of scale. Mm -hmm. uh, but there, we all face very similar challenges. And at the heart of it is not to forget these are human beings um, right. who have their daily lives, their toils, their, mm -hmm. you know, their moments. Um, so we also need to be, whilst we're thinking population and population viral load, there are individuals who are grappling with this mm -hmm. extraordinary disease mm -hmm. on a daily basis. And, and you know, triumphing in most cases uh, in the most extraordinary way. So I continue after 30 years in this business to be overwhelmed by the resilience of human beings and, and humanity and what humans can achieve when given opportunities. So. And the Croy Secretariat has agreed to, and, and on continuously, I should say, not just now, but to have you know scholarships for the community, the, the enlightened community who are who come here and then they take information back. So I know that there's going to be a lot. We have had some in their own languages talk on, on this set and others uh, for them. We make that available because it's so important to them, you know, most important to them, more important than anywhere else to, for them to get, engage and do the messaging that you suggest is critical. You know, so, and get, so bringing them to a, you know, to a conference like this is key because knowledge is very much a key component. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Linda. Absolute for your time. pleasure, Thank Fred. You. Thank you for having me.